Hello everyone, welcome in the spirit of honesty. I started this book mm, like two days ago. I've been diligently taking notes. If it wasn't clear already, we are reading Art on My Mind, Visual Politics by Bell Hooks, where basically Bell Hooks is just giving her perspective and her experience in the art world from the lens of a black female artist. At least that's the gist that I've got so far from reading. <laughs> the thing about it is this is a new video format for me. So I kind of was reading the book, forgetting the fact that I was going to do a book vlog, therefore forgetting the fact that I need to record the thoughts that I was having while I was reading the book. But that's okay. We've only read the prologue and up to like page three. So we haven't missed out on much. Let's go ahead and get started. I'm just going to kind of go through a couple of the sticky notes that I've already put. Okay, so she opened the book with a point that is kind of pervasive throughout the entire book so far as I've read, obviously, which is this idea of the fact that visual arts is not just art, it's not just something cute, it's not just something pretty to look at, but it also has political undertones that needs to be acknowledged. And on this sticky note, I wrote that I thought that that was a really good thing to keep in mind because currently I am kind of starting my own like little personal study when it comes to fashion design and it's really good to keep in mind that it's not just artistic it's not just about the fabrics the colors the shapes yada 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 it's about the intention the message and the experience specifically for me as like a triple minority <laughs> the life that you have lived and how that is expressed through the clothing and it's something that was already kind of on my brain because i've been watching a lot of uh ryan finn on youtube and they talk a lot about fashion and the nuances of fashion the psychological the political aspects of clothing and just really analyzes them on a deeper level than most fashion analysis I've seen, which doesn't say a lot because I haven't <laughs> seen much fashion analysis, but it did open my brain up to the fact that art is just so much more than aesthetics. Bell Hooks mentions a lot in the introduction personal experiences that have shaped her reasoning for writing this book. For example, she realized that there were really just not a lot of people who looked like her who were being given the opportunity to take up space and how the art world was really limited and even the most groundbreaking critiques of her time would mention the critiques of black women and their work but not actually name the black women who said those words who made those critiques themselves and she was also sharing experiences of her first exposures with the people who acknowledged art as a necessity in this world that being her uncle and then this teacher that she had during high school her art teacher all of that to say it just really brought to mind the fact that when you're creating you are driven by life experience and that's a really good reminder for me as a content creator as someone who is interested in getting into writing and getting into fashion design and getting into a bunch of different areas it's just important to remember that if you do not live you do not have a story to tell like you can't just sit at the computer for 24 hours a day and expect to have something to write eventually you're going to get sick of writing about past experiences to constantly have that influx of new ideas and inspirations you have to live was bell hooks talking about this at all no <laughs> there was this one quote that thought was just so good. She says, I asked my audience to consider why in so many instances of global imperialist conquest by the West, art has been either appropriated or destroyed. I shared my amazement at all the African art I first saw years ago in the museums and galleries of Paris. It occurred to me then that if one could make a people lose touch with their capacity to create, lose sight of their will and their power to make art, then the work of subjugation, of colonization, is complete what it just ties into this thing that i've been complaining about recently which is a lack of imagination and how i feel like the world that i've grown up in and that i'm living in currently which is the culture which is american culture it it like intentionally strips away your imagination you don't have the time you don't have the energy you don't have the space you don't have the resources none of it to create and when she tied it into colonization when i tied it to the messages that i've been getting about anti-intellectualism and how that's been on the rise for years and years and years that whole thing where people are like it's not that deep yes it is it's this unwillingness to go deeper take time and sit with the things that we do not know to the point where we do figure them out and then proceed to 
innovate that's literally how innovation occurs the culture that we live in is dependent on the maintenance of hierarchy and one of the ways to maintain hierarchy is to snuff out the necessities for creation within repressed communities and that's such an inspiring thought to me which might sound weird but it's like you can actively resist against things when you know what's going on Okay, this one's a little bit longer. <laughs> she said, During the many years that I remained in a relationship that was heartbreaking, I found hope and renewal for my spirits in this image of union between lovers, of joyous escape. This print was placed so that I would look at it every day when I awakened. It worked magic in my soul. Andres Serrano's photograph of Circle of Blood was similarly healing to my spirit. In a period of long illness when I was in danger of bleeding my life away, I developed a hatred of blood so intense that it disrupted my capacity to function effectively. Serrano's image restored my appreciation for blood as a life-giving force. There are just two examples of the ways in which beautiful works of art have completely and constructively influenced my thoughts, my habits of being. There's just something different about reading bell hooks out loud. I'm not gonna fangirl over that right now. The point that I'm trying to make, I feel like it just brought me back. It's like the paragraph did for me what it was talking about. Like it's just a big thing for me for 2023, as I've mentioned on this channel before, is rekindling my connection to my creativity. When I was younger, I, I felt art so deeply. I would listen to songs and I would cry to them for hours. I would go on school field trips and look through museums and I would be in tears. Art in all forms used to just leave me in the most philosophical of places. As I've gone through COVID and just gone through a lot of transitions in life, it's like my focus has been to a lot more quote unquote practical things or just disassociation really because the world right now is just stressful. Art was starting to feel meaningless. I don't want to rant too long, but basically it just reminded me of the purpose of art. We are in my school's library right now. I just finished up um, doing some changes to my schedule because it got massively destroyed, completely imploded, if you will. I'm getting kind of tired of staring at my screen, so I'm gonna do a little bit of reading from Art On My Mind. What I really need to do is figure out how many pages I need to be reading every single day to actually finish this book by the time this video needs to go up. I have been severely slacking. And then I anticipate that it'll get even worse considering the fact that I have so much reading to do for school. This book isn't even that long anyway, although the font is small. Okay, let me actually get to reading. Lord. 34 pages per day. Okay, even as we hit the first few sentences, I have a thought. So she gives the story of basically this artist, um, this black female artist who was more integrated in like the high art spaces. She allowed herself to learn more about folk art and started integrating that into her artistic practice. It's basically what she's known for at this point. Bell Hooks was just kind of highlighting the importance of really integration, really letting go of the taboo surrounding certain ideas, engaging with it critically, and allowing that critical thought to integrate into our own lives and basically break down any biases that we may have in certain areas in order to evolve. I think that's a really good thing to keep in mind because an example that I thought of as I was reading was homelessness. I feel like this is a big example of that. People in America have such a low perception or low opinion of homelessness despite the fact that they like to put on that show of like oh homeless people that's so sad like we, we we need to be caring for the homeless but at the same time the government will put up like anti-homeless architecture as well as allow largely african-american spaces to be gentrified which causes a large level of homelessness landlords prices are not regulated to the point where people literally cannot afford rent so it's like this idea of homelessness in america is seen as taboo is seen as something that you would never want for yourself and therefore when you see other people in that position you think that there's something wrong with them or something that they have done wrong like they've gone down some sort of wrong pathway they've done something to deserve the position that they are in and yet when you think about it critically more likely the government has done something or the policies in place have done something the policy makers that we have elected into office have done something which has then caused the standard of living for these people to deteriorate and it doesn't deteriorate only on a physical sense but also 
in a sense of social standing because they are now looked down upon or seen as other. That's just one example that came to mind as I was reading it. I just think it's really important that we think critically about taboo topics, quote unquote taboo topics. That just ties directly into anti-intellectualism where we're in this period of time where people are so inclined to say it's not that deep when if we do go that deep, there's just so much to learn and to not go that deep is kind of a disservice to our capacity for understanding and love as human beings. I can't, I can't with Miss Bell Hooks, I can't. Sar, the artist, was impressed by the depths of their commitment to making art, not for fame or money, but for the elevation of the human spirit. This video is going to be so, so long, but that's okay. <laughs> It is this paradoxical mystery Sar calls us to embrace in the modern world that privileges order and control, that denies the power of destiny and fate. I have this thought every, every so often where I really wonder what it would look like to live in a culture that did not value, as I said, order and control. What does it look like when everything just kind of falls apart? And I feel like this is such a privilege question to have because there are so many countries in the world that have seen their worlds completely torn apart but what i'm talking about here is not destruction for destruction's sake but i'm talking about destruction for the sake of evolution and it's funny how much fear that brings up how much fear that brings to mind because of course as humans or at least this human <laughs> i value stability but it's like is reliability holding us back i don't know i don't have the answer to that question but <laughs> have fun thinking about that for the next couple of hours I got to this part in the book, I hope you can hear me, I'm outside, but Bell Hooks is talking about this one artist, Kari May Weems. She says, she was motivated by a longing to restore knowledge, not by a desire to uphold an essentialist politics of representation. I feel like I've been getting a lot of like information or readings talking about um, essentialism in terms of black people and our understanding of ourselves and our understanding of <laughs> other black people, our understanding of blackness as a whole. I don't know, it just goes in line with a lot of the things that I believe in spiritually, whereas we're all constantly changing, evolving, trying to ascribe, I think, any particular identity or any particular description to a group of people or even an individual person is pretty much impossible because we're always changing. I'm just noticing in a lot of the movements that have happened within the black community tend to try to ascribe this collective identity of blackness in an effort to create a sense of unity. Think Marcus Garvey and Garveyism and his whole pan-Africanist ideal. I feel like that's kind of counterintuitive because that's what whiteness does. It defines blackness. It limits blackness. So in actuality, the only way to really release ourselves from a supremacist way of thinking is to deny this uniform idea of blackness and to, I don't know, I like the radical part of me wants to say reject, reject race as a whole. Like, yes, I'm black, but like, what does, what does that mean beyond a skin color, you know? And it's like, does it mean anything beyond a skin color? And I think the answer should be no. That's all I have to say on that. Hello, hello. What day is it today? I was about to say it's 9.05. <laughs> it's 
It's March 19th. So the last time I was reading from Art On My Mind, I was at the hair salon, you know, getting my hair done, massaged, straightened, deep conditioned, all that jazz. It was such a nice experience. Reading from a black woman about black women while being surrounded by black women as a black woman myself. It was kind of a slay. For the majority of the time that I was reading, um, uh, Bell Hooks, I just forgot the name of the author for a second. Okay, so the chapter is called Architecture in Black. This book is fighting me right now. I'm sorry, let's get it together. This chapter that I'm talking about is Architecture in Black Life, Talking Space with Laverne Wells Bowie. That starts on page 152. And the chapter previously, that's more talking about her. This one is more like a conversation with her. I'm gonna be so real. Bell Hooks, um, sometimes her language can get a little convoluted to me. Although I love it most times, it's just like sometimes it's packed with too many, I don't want to say big words because I don't think people should be shielded from using whatever is in their vocabulary. It's just like too many big words together. Like it, it, it's not flowing as it usually does. However, there was a quote at the end of the chapter that brought the entire chapter together for me and gave it a little bit of clarity. Overall, we have to think deeply about the cultural legacies that can sustain us, that can protect us against the cultural genocide that is daily destroying our past. We need to document the existence of living traditions, both past and present, that can heal our wounds and offer us a space of opportunity where our lives can be transformed. Throughout this entire chapter, what they are actually discussing is architecture and black life. Bell Hooks is talking about these homes, these shacks that her family used to live in, that her neighborhood was kind of made up of. And I guess I found this chapter very interesting because for a point in my life, I was actually thinking about becoming um, an architect. And that was before I found out that there was like a lot of math that went into that. Not to say I'm bad at math, but just like, do I really want to do that? Mm, no. But I, I love the idea of designing spaces. I'm in a little Art Nouveau, mid-century modern, I think is the name of it i'm in that kind of phase right now like lots of jewel tones mixed with a lot of earthy tones lots of colored tile lots of patterned granite chandeliers i'll put some pictures up for reference i found that this chapter just like this entire book honestly and the whole purpose of reading is that it just kind of shifted my perspective on or opened my mind up to what architecture is and what interior design is beyond just making things pretty because of course i'm a libra so i love things to be beautiful and that's like my draw to it but bell hooks gave this perspective that architecture like many simple factors of existence of black life is a form of resistance not only are we taking up space in a world where space has systematically been denied? Livable space especially has been denied us. Also, also it gives us the space to take up space. <laughs> just love that word because within these homes that we build we are creating nurturing spaces where we are fuel for resistance from this perspective the home serves as this kind of nesting egg where creation begins i wrote a few sticky notes down and on this one i was just kind of blabbing about how i've witnessed black people in my life imagining their homes and kind of using this imagination as a sort of motivation as a sort of drive like for example my mom very successful wonderful black woman she, she always tells me that she dreamed of having a wraparound porch she could you know go outside drink her coffee where she could do her work just kind of stare out onto the world and peace and stability rather than having to rely on the world to give it to you that's what architecture allows you to do it allows you to mold or envision or bring about a world that you want to see that you don't see yet so it's like a form of alchemy all of these negative emotions that you have about the world about being black it's a shedding opportunity let go of all of those narratives let go of all of the stories the limiting narratives because that's truly what they are although they may be true they are still limiting so in order to extend ourselves beyond that architecture serves as kind of a medium for it and because it's so tangible i guess more in terms of the way that bell hooks was describing it in that her family lived in shacks versus me and my imaginations of a mid-century modern art nouveau cottage because it could be done it served as a sort of motivation for other forms of resistance that existed beyond architecture and just kind of like as an homage to her words i thought i would share a couple of things that i would like to be in my future home i came up with this a while ago actually 
actually i think this is just the only one i'm going to share but because it's like one of the most major things actually i have two things two things <laughs> one of them is a garden i want a garden so bad i want multiple raised beds i might want a few animals not to eat though i don't want to eat the animals i want a flower field i want arches i want a greenhouse like i want it all i want to be the medicine woman gardening is just the most accessible and just most obvious not example obvious proof obvious proof of the abundance that this world carries um i feel like living within oppressive structures that kind of layer on top of each other and are hard to decipher through on a daily basis it can be easy to forget the abundance that exists in this world it can be easy to fall into the narratives of scarcity and spread that narrative of scarcity or extend that narrative of scarcity onto those around you in the way of competition so to me just having the time every day to go outside to commune with with nature on a regular basis as a constant intentional remembrance of the abundance of this life and just how much scarcity does not exist the fact that it was created means that it can be uncreated with the right form of action with the right form of collective action the second thing that i would love to have in my home that i shall have in my home ashe is a dance room not really like a dance room i just want it to look like a dance room but it would really be more of like a creation room right stick with me what i imagine a rectangular shaped four walled room on the two sides of the wall on this side and on this side you have mirrors along the wall and you have like the little bars that you know you'll see in a ballet dance room on the other side of the wall i don't really care what's there maybe we'll have some art on this side of the wall i want it to be pointing on the outside of the house and i want it to be facing the sun so that you can see the sunrise and the sunset and that's the lighting for the room also i want it to be where the full moon can be seen that is where the ritual shall be done i i do want it to be a space of dancing because I love to dance, but I'm also terrified of dancing. I I'm gonna work myself out of that. There's so many styles of dance that I wanna do. Might get some flack for this one, but I would love pole dancing. I feel like pole dancing has a bad rap and that it can actually be extremely artistic and actually a great exercise and actually really beautiful. So sticking with that. So I would wanna pole in there. I would also wanna learn, I like salsa dance. So be in there with my partner, you know, turn on some salsa music, you know, get to moving. I would also like to have an editing space in the room, a painting space in the room, a sewing space in the room have a nice mannequin in there have a space to like cut all my fabrics on the ground i hope i'm explaining this one i feel like i am the vision is mine you know the vision is mine and it's mine to bring into fruition and it's not going to be understood in its entirety until it's created which i'm okay with i feel like such a big part of my existence like how i'm going to be existing from now on in life is to make sure that i am always embracing some kind of art i know for a fact that i need art to breathe, to live, which sounds so cheesy, but I think it's true. YouTube is a form of art for me. Playing around with the color grading and the editing and yada, 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 yeah. I never get tired of it because there's always something more to learn. Even when I feel like I've understood a program or I've understood an editing style to a certain degree, I can always switch and I can always expand deeper or dig deeper into what I already do know to then become a more evolved version of myself. It feels like an expression of what humanity is truly meant to be doing. And not in the grind hustle culture way, just all always learning that that's the word we're always meant to be learning we're always meant to be growing but we're always meant to be learning and that artistic space that creation space for me in my home would be a place where that learning could be um done okay that's all i have for you guys tonight As children, we marked the intensity of our bonds with outsiders by sharing blood. Who is we? I'm done! It's done! <gasps> now that the book is complete, of course we have to talk about it. I just read the last chapter, which was The Radiance of Red, Bloodworks. She talks about this artist, Andres Serrano, who is actually mentioned in the beginning and like the introduction, where she basically described him or his work as renewing her perspective on blood as a life-giving force. But in this chapter, she goes more into specifically Andres Serrano's work. Apparently his work was very subversive. It was very like in your face. When she's saying blood works, she means blood work. His work was seen as something for shock value rather than something 
that was revolutionary that had depth beyond people's initial reactions. His work had a lot to do with the rejection of repression within the church, really. Repression of sexuality, repression of women. She didn't say this explicitly, but I would get repression of queerness. Any repression you could imagine. <laughs> One of the major characteristics of his work is this focus on the commonalities among human beings, but that we see as taboo or disgusting, like he, us having like urine and us having blood in our body. I'm thinking like breathing oxygen, but we don't really demonize that one as much obviously but apparently a lot of his pieces aim to suggest that in demonizing those things we kind of reject ourselves we reject ourselves as human beings and we also reject the humanness of the other people around us and bell hooks did go on to kind of make this point where she was like this applies a lot to womanhood where it's like this commonality of menstruation among us that commonality is um demonized by both ourselves and men around us the only thing that i didn't like about that point was I guess it makes sense for the period of feminism that Bell Hooks was existing in, so I'm not infuriated by it, but I would like to make the point that with our expanding definition of gender, it, I, I just think it's good to keep in mind that not every woman has, or menstruates, not every woman has a cycle, not every woman can relate to that experience. I just think it's important when you're reading books from like a different period, you keep in mind the developments that have been happening during your time and kind of apply them. I think it's actually kind of a revolutionary thing, like instead of going out and being like, oh my god, like she must have been like transphobic or something, like please. However, it is important to keep the evolutions that have happened in mind as a form of intellectual lineage. Anyway, back to Serrano. There was this one part that I thought was interesting where uh, a person was describing his reaction to one of Serrano's pieces called Milk Blood. He says, categories which I long ago rejected intellectually, I suddenly desired to uphold emotionally. They seemed natural and inviolable, but not only had they been juxtaposed, they seemed to bleed into one another down the middle of the photo unthinkable and yet here was the record of this transgression and i just really related to that experience because i've seen things hurt things where immediately there's like a visceral internal reaction for example i was walking with my partner to this house and he walked through the grass and i was like why did you just walk through the grass <laughs> because i had always been taught when i was growing up you don't walk through people's grass recently i've been learning a lot more about the politics of grass, which sounds ridiculous, but it's not. I think it actually plays a lot of role in the repression of suburbia, but that's another topic. But even so, with that understanding, internally, I was like, why are you walking on the person's grass? You're not supposed to walk on people's grass, you know? Like, it's just those little things that are wedged into our subconscious where they come about and they surprise us, but I think that what Bell Hooks was trying to say about Serrano's work was not, like I was saying, it's not about the first initial reaction. It's not about the shock value. It's about what you do after you experience that emotion or that feeling, or when you get that reaction, what do you do with that reaction? And what he's saying is what you're supposed to do with that reaction is to interrogate and detach from it. He, he emphasizes detachment a lot and in the last few paragraphs she describes another one of his works where it's like a circle. I think it was like this red circle. She didn't have a picture of this one unfortunately. That's something I would have loved to see more in this book is like more if you describe a work or you mention a work then you should have a picture of the work so that I understand better what you're talking about. <laughs> Getting a little ahead of myself. The piece was called Circle of Blood. Apparently it was like this red banded circle and then there was a yellow band outside of the red. It demonstrated a common eastern philosophy? Correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like among the different philosophies I've seen from Eastern cultures, this is a commonality between them. This concept of always returning back to wholeness. Beyond the shape, the color of it represented like the, the circulation of blood throughout the body and that also being a representation of wholeness in that it also moves in a pseudo-circular motion. And then the yellow band on the outside was kind of representative of the sun, which was just like a reminder of our interconnectedness with nature how we are beings of nature and sometimes we forget about that we put ourselves above nature when we are literally a part of nature so yeah that was oh my god that was our on my mind i'm so, I'm so excited i hope you enjoyed my very first book vlog i know i enjoyed doing it i just know that everything that was said in this book is going to it's gonna take like years and years for it to like sink within my subconscious but for the time being i feel like i just have this greater sense of what art means to me, of the purpose of art, of 
the possibilities of art and also the community that can be found in art. I was expecting a completely different book, let me be for real. I saw this on somebody's story. They had posted a particular paragraph or page from the book and it was talking about her own personal experience with developing her art. So I thought that's what the entire book was going to be. I didn't even think that this was like an art critique. I went in this blind. I didn't think that there was going to be critique. I didn't think that there were going to be photographs, images. I didn't think that there were going to be interviews, but it was great. It was excellent. I would not have asked for anything different, but I say that to say it just, the interview specifically showed to me that artists cannot be existing in a bubble. They can't exist as individuals. We're not supposed to be existing as individuals. We're supposed to be existing in community. And that doesn't go just for artists. That goes for everybody, but I'm talking about in specifically artistic spaces because we're all pulling from or at least I think that we're all pulling from this collective consciousness that gets accelerated and I think infused with so much more magic if it's done in community, if it's done amongst other people. So that is art on my mind, visual politics. I'll see y'all next time.